You're listening to the Clean Comedy Podcast with your host, James Creviston. Welcome to the Queen Comedy Podcast. It's James. And today I have a guest that's been on the podcast before. That's one of my favorite people. Uh, give me some great advice. Been in my corner. Is just a wonderful, fun, amazing person. And you've seen him. And now he's back and he's got another special that I missed somehow because, as in his own words, I've been watching Golden Girls reruns, which is very true. That's what I do. Um, but please welcome back the very funny, the very talented Jeff Shaw. Jeff, welcome back. Hey. Um, if you, if I, if the advice I gave you was so great, why are you still doing this podcast? <laughs> why are you still coming on the podcast then? <laughs> no one's giving me good advice. <laughs> you do give me good advice uh, several times. In fact, there was like an hour conversation where we went over jokes and it was amazing. And I, I been tweaking that and working uh, on it. I've been doing it in, on host gigs. I've been hosting with uh, Randy Lubis' shows. So yeah, no, a hundred percent taking your advice and working on it. I'm not at your level yet. I'm going to get there one day, but I'm not there. But having friends like you is what makes me get better every single day. And I just talked to somebody about you. I just had, uh, well, I had hot cocoa. We were at Starbucks, but I had co- hot cocoa and David Rosie Rosenberg and I talked about you while we were there. So you're, you're, you're on everybody's mind. Hey, Cause I reached, I reached out to him and I, I watched that podcast yeah and uh and i thought oh man james is scraping the bottom of the barrel i'll have to go Uh. on again (laughs) no it's great because i uh, not only is rosie like very funny but he's like a great improv comic and of all all, he was one of the comics i hung out with the last time i was in la that's how much i like him but uh i was so thrilled to see him on your podcast here's why um, when, we, when he and I worked together, I think in the summer of 2019 for some really cool, like one nighters in Arizona for like, uh, and, and Laughlin for entertainment max, we did a great run together. We went up to Vegas and hung out. He was not a clean comic. I mean, he was yeah. good and wasn't, wasn't too dirty for me, but he wasn't like clean. Yeah. And I, and I don't know if he, if he saw the light or if, if you, kidnapped him and um and forced him to do the podcast but i was like wow you know because he's doing more clean stuff he wants to do more clean stuff we've been talking about it. i've been working on stuff with him so he's he's a great he's a great guy i i love him uh he loves you it's it's great this is the best part of comedy guys like if you don't know about this it's like having a bunch of brothers like a bunch of brothers that will razz you that will give you advice that will sometimes kick you when you're down because you deserve it and then also pick you back up afterwards right yeah and it's all it's amazing (laughs) how we all all know each other because um first of all you can't do comedy without as a lone wolf i mean you got to have um kind of a support network and also too when you're a comedian like it's not a job most people understand and so the only people that really understand what you're going through are other comedians Yep. You know, and also, and also too, you know, I, I'm lucky that uh, I work with so many younger comedians that have uh, working with young comedians like Rosie or let a lot of the comics in Cleveland or, you know, um, comedy's changed since I got into the game. And now comedy is more reality based. It's more about expressing who you are as a human being and your jokes have to have some type of purpose. You're not just being funny anymore. You have to have like a little bit of a story or something you're trying to communicate. And it's all about developing ideas and thoughts and opinions at the same time you're learning your craft. Back when when I was getting started in the 80s, it, all that mattered is if you knew how to write jokes. Now it's a given you know how to write jokes. It's what are you going to write your jokes about? Yep. That's what sets everybody apart. So if, if, uh, when I work with young comics, um, or I mean, like, you know, half my age or whatever, maybe like I consider a young comic, someone doing it 10 years, I've been doing it 35 years. Yeah. So, uh, so somebody been doing it for like five years, 10 years, whatever feature headliner, you know, uh, they get the benefit of my experience, you know, uh, you know, and, uh, and also, uh, you know, I, I'm a good joke doctor, I think. Yep. 
and uh, like like you 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 said earlier, but also too is by watching a lot of young guys and um, helping them turn me on to a lot of amazing comedians. Um, I think why I've stayed relevant and why my career is thriving now is because I know my place, I know who I am, but at, 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 at the same time, I've embraced modern comedy. Like I like you said, my specials, I try to talk about my experience, who I am. And then I've got the benefit of my joke writing skills. You know, like, like so like when I, when I go to comedy clubs and I hang out with young comedians, I went to an, uh, a showcase show last night, I was on the bill in Cleveland. It was uh, a local comic by the name of Bill Squire who has a, he's on one of the radio personalities on, on an afternoon radio show here. He had a, a great, great bar show where everybody's listening, you know, great yeah. lights and sound, uh, the TVs are turned down and it was like a real show. And then all the young comics come up and hanging out with me after the show and complimenting me and picking my brain. I love it because um, by working with young comedians that embrace newer comedy, you know, uh, uh, being confessional, having a story, having a point of view, I feed off of that. And I've, I've been turned on to so many great comedians and uh, they respect me instead of like, oh, this guy's a hack or he's a has been or he's too old or whatever, because yeah. th there are other comics my age from my graduating class that look <laughs> down on newer comics and go, ah, you know, I don't care, you know, what this person's sexual identity is. I don't care what their politics are. It's funny, it's funny. I disagree with that. And I think the fact that because I became uh, a fan of alt comedy and you know modern comedy so to speak a, a personal modern day comedy uh that i was able to uh, uh, adapt and embrace it and i think that it helps me fit in with younger comics we have a common ground yeah you know that's, and i'm not i'm not threatened because because now i realize you can control how good of a craftsman you are or a craftswoman that's time and grade. That's but uh, in the seat at the computer writing and, and learning. But nowadays, that's not really what makes you famous or breaks you. It's it's the quality of your ideas and and what you have to say. And I may be able to you know learn how to write jokes better maybe than a twenty four year old. But if somebody you know, if, if somebody is 24 and 25 has a unique life and the story and way of looking, well, there's nothing I can do about that. Right. You know, so I think that when you're jealous of other comics or threatened by people of a different style or a different, you know, comedy gang, so to speak, <laughs> um, it's because you don't feel empowered in your own comedy. I feel like a lot of comedians don't feel empowered. Uh, older comics because they're threatened by the new styles of comedy that have dominated the scene and the industry and me uh by embracing uh new comedy so to speak um it's made me a better comedian yeah yeah and that's good that's the, that's the thing is like i always look at i like to look at old comedy and i like to look at what's happening now and see okay are there any pieces missing you know, maybe can we bring something from the old style back here? Um, you know, there's, I love a lot of, a lot of comedy that's, that's going, um, Robert Mack reminds me of, I don't know if you know, Robert Mack, Robert Mack reminds me of Steve Martin a lot, right? Nobody does that anymore. He does it. It's very unique and interesting. And that's, that's a new thing. I I, he's bringing, I, oh, bring it back. Yeah. Well, he's, yeah, in, in a way, but I think he's more like a, you know, like a Stephen Wright in a way. I mean, yeah. he's such a great joke writer. He has That's two true. dry bar specials too. Yeah. But yeah, he's one of my favorite dry bar comedians. Yeah, but he gives me, also gives me a Steve Martin kind of vibe of like I'm the the smart idiot kind of guy type thing. You know, and and, oh, yeah, and so yeah. so I I I love that. And I yeah, Stephen Wright very much a lot of that as well. So this new special, the High Voice of Reason. How, how when did you film it? And it came out in September, so it's out now. So you guys can go check it out. When did you film it? What was it? Um, a, Let's hear about it. I taped it. Uh, uh, I taped my second dry bar comedy special, The High Voice of Reason. Uh, there are clips available on YouTube and also on comedianjeffshaw.com under stand-up videos. But you could also uh, watch the whole special. Uh, I'll, I'll send you a link to it. But um, okay. 
fans out there can, um, if they don't have the comedy, uh, the Dry Bar Comedy Plus app, which is a great app, you can watch, it like is. I have it, and I watch, I mean, I, I've got hundreds of, of specials in my queue still. I mean, there's so many specials three a week that I can't keep up with them. But if you use my promo code, Jeff Shaw, you can get a discount. And um, I taped it in uh, March of 2021. Okay. So it took almost like a year and a half to come out. And I taped it a year to the weekend of my um, appear or my uh, my taping of Amer- I wouldn't say appearance, but taping of America's Got Talent. Wow! And it I taped it in the uh, the height of the the COVID shutdown. So it was both like me dealing with COVID and then also having something positive to do on the anniversary of my uh, ill fated AGT appearance that um that it meant a lot to me this was a difficult uh special to prepare for because um it was hard to get stage i was like i was like driving to clubs for 150 bucks yeah you know and putting myself up in a hotel just so i could run my set you know and then you know uh and i was doing the set on zoom shows and things like that so i had a uh i was uh I was scheduled to, in February of 21, I was scheduled to open for Jeff Allen, who has like three drive on specials. Yeah. And he, uh, he got sick or I had COVID or something or something happened with his family. And so they moved me up the headliner and I uh, practiced for my set, my second special. And then Mark, uh, Mike Paramore moved into my spot. And, he, and so we both got to run our dry bar specials um, one night at Hilarities. And, uh, and then I did a couple other dates. So when I showed up, it was mostly, you know, mostly me rehearsing in front of a mirror wow. and reciting and, and talking in the car. And whenever I take a drive or a special, there's a park uh, near a canyon that I go walk for, for like hours going over my set, uh, uh, you know, the mountains and, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. So when I did it, they were at very 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 restricted capacity there was no more than 50 people in the audience for either wow. show and they have like 300 people for the, my first taping in 19 so this one was difficult because um the audience wasn't as jazzed and uh, the second set they forgot i would uh, when the, when you tape a second dry bar they have you go first both shows so that the new comics can watch you and see how everything goes and gets used to watching everything. So um, when I went up the second taping, they forgot to tell everybody they could take their masks off while they're sitting at their seats. Oh. So my, my second taping, everybody was wearing their masks and nobody was laughing and it was complete silence. Uh, and uh, But because I knew this wasn't a comedy club gig, it was a TV taping. And all that matters is what you see on the camera I just went, I just had my set so rehearsed that I just filled in the laughter in my head and just, I just slowed down and just like pretended like everybody's laughing. And that really impressed the heck out of everybody there, especially the directors, because now they had a whole show of footage they could fly into the first taping and to fix mistakes and everything. And uh, if I hadn't have already done a dry bar special and knew like watch them um, recording it, sitting in Video Village, watching the other comics perform, seeing how it looks on the camera, seeing the decisions that they make as far as editing and directing, and also going through the process of looking at the raw footage and having them edit it and approve the edits. Right. I wouldn't have had the confidence to just fly by my instrument, instrument so to speak, and land right. the plane. <laughs> and And already having the dry bar experience of knocking out of the park and you know, big standing ovation, this and that, whatever. Um, the second show is more like I had to be, you know, a technician and land the pl- you know, pilot, and land the plane. And uh, so that's what made the second special more gratifying. Even if certain segments of the special weren't as well rehearsed or um, if the laughter was a little weird in some places, whatever, because of the, the small crowd. But for the most part, you know, it was uh, a special that was, you know, taped under less than ideal circumstances and everyone involved, the staff, the other comedians, I think we all made the most of it. Yeah. 
That's awesome. And now you're out doing cruise ships, which I, I'm glad that that's back. I know I have a lot of com- comedian friends that are back out doing cruise ships and stuff. How is how, how has that changed? Has that changed a lot since before COVID? What what have you noticed the difference? What's the it, difference it, there? It's changed now. It's changing back. Um, okay. How it changed is uh, is we had to wear like uh, well like a, j- a joke I do now like we don't we don't have to wear masks because uh, you know uh, the, uh, we, we're now like as of like last week or two weeks ago we no longer have to wear masks on the ship uh, oh. us meaning comedians and staff members. So my my joke was uh, if car well, that's good because if Carnival had made me wear one more mask one more time for one more cruise I would have because I need the money. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, so now things are back to normal, so to speak. And what was happening was uh, normally when you work a Carnival cruise, what you do is you you fly into a foreign port, get on the ship finish out as the comedian for the second half of the cruise. Then what you do is you stay on in the ship's home port, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Cape Canaveral, what have you. And then you go out and do the first half and then fly out of that port, usually another port, and then other comedians get on in that port for the second half, so on and so forth. So what was happened was we were, um, it was really hard. It was impossible to fly people out of foreign ports because of the COVID regulations. So we would have to get on in home ports and leave in a home port. And wow. that made travel a lot more difficult. And it also, uh, instead of getting two pay segments for one week, you would get one pay segment. So what they would do is they would fill up your calendar and you would, you would do the same shit for like three weeks or four weeks. Wow. And then, you know, so you would make less money than you would, but you're getting a longer booking so you're you're making more money and now it's going back to flying in and flying out um and so i had two cruises that were condensed and that's why i have time off now at home so i can do this right well i i appreciate the crowds it are, the crowds are great and that and the cruise lines treat you really good now and even better than before and then everyone's happy and the vibe's really positive so you know and uh, it's it's going great I, I'm gonna say one thing that's not related to your comedy, but I love the the blanket on your bed because I love oh, the, kiss, yeah. the kiss stuff. It's that's awesome. So I just yeah, that was um that was a uh, I have to have it on there because that was like a gift from my nieces. It's awesome. Yeah, I, so like it was like it's a and my, and my nephew it was like a, a gift. So like you know, so yeah, I'm just doing that to appease the kids in my family, and that's my story, <laughs> Your Honor, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> now. Now, are they? But, uh, I, I have no excuse for the kiss socks. I don't oh, know where those came from. Nice. There you go. Now, uh, or, are you? Oh my gosh. More? The, the kiss cola. I have. Oh, no I've had one of those. They're actually really good. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah. This. Yeah, or. <laughs> the kiss pad dispensers. Oh, that's so cool. Oh man, yeah, that's so awesome. I'm, I am not a hopeless, pathetic, middle-aged loser. <laughs> These are all gifts from young kids in my family who would be heartbroken if I didn't display them. There you go. I really think that the that the Gene Simmons Pez dispenser should have had the tongue on the bottom, so when it opens up, it comes out where his tongue is. That would have been awesome. <laughs> yeah, that would that would be awesome. <laughs> That'd be the way to do it. So, um, do you have a date for another dry bar? Are you getting more building more material so that you can go back to any of that kind of stuff? No, I don't. I don't think I'll do a third one because uh, you you can't do another one until your uh, your special is paid off. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, and um, it'll it'll be years before this one gets paid off because um, uh, everything's kind of you know changed. Like dry bars aren't are, are, uh, I mean are they're so common right now. Like it, it's going right. to be soon. Like before, you know, people say send me a tape and you go I got a dry bar. They go oh, if you got a dry bar, we'll just book you. Right. But now it's getting to the point, go, hey, I'd like to work your room. Oh, okay. Send me your dry bar. Yeah, I know. You know, you know by the time bar, I get my dry bar, everyone's everyone else is going to have a dry bar. Yeah, I'll have four before you have your first dry bar. <laughs> that's probably true, actually. That's probably very yeah. true. Yeah, but, uh, but, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I mean, if they're still around in a couple, I mean, they should be, I, I mean, I'd be open to doing another one. I yeah. just, I, yeah. It's not, what I mean is that I don't think I'd be offered to do another one because right. uh, it's harder to make money with the new specials. But but the cool thing is, is they have all these really new revenue streams. They're really on top of everything at Drybar. They have 
so many inventive ways. And they've also kind of lowered the cost of the production costs for the um, uh, making some smart decisions to like, you know, use the same backdrop for more comedians because those are very beautiful backdrops. And, you know, yeah. they have like, they have accomplished, you know, professional, you know, um, theater artists, you know, creating those backdrops, you know, so, and things like that, that they lower the, you know, they're trying to make it so you can make your money back yeah. more quickly. Uh, but once you pay, like, you don't pay a dime, it just comes out of your royalties. Right. And so, um, and then what happens is once it's paid off all the production costs and you start making money and then you can do another special. So, awesome. um, so I might, it, it, it might pay itself off in, you know, a couple of years because they're coming up with all these great new um, ways to create revenue streams. But yeah, um, I think that the days of like millions of views on, on YouTube and stuff are a thing of the past, but uh, hopefully I'm wrong. But um, uh, compared to like the numbers for everybody else's specials that are coming out, mine seems to be doing fairly well, but I'm, I'm just proud to have a second one because I love dry bar. I love, yeah the whole organization and I love the specials and I'm a fan of all the other comedians that do it. So yeah. it's, uh, it's cool to be, you know, it's, it's more a personal honor than anything else. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's, it's really is one of my goals. Like that is really one of my goals. That's what I'm working towards. I'm really working on material and trying to get there. That's why I'm hosting a lot more working on stuff and crowd stuff and everything that I can do to get better and better with every, every show I go on, because that is really one of the end goals. And I'm so glad for people like you who are willing to give their time and their information and share that stuff with the rest of us. Cause well, we're not as good. We're not as good as you yet, but we're going to, we're getting, we're going to get there. I promise. Well, <laughs> the thing is, is I feel bad sometimes because like, you're like, Hey Jeff, can you help me with your video? And then when I'm done cutting it to shreds, you have one joke and two punch, uh, one, two <laughs> setups and one punchline left. Yeah. No, it was I, it, just so everybody knows it wasn't like that. Jeff just went through it. It was like, this needs to be tightened here. This needs to be fixed here. You can do this and this. So he, he didn't really sh rip it to sh that shreds. He, he did fix it, but he didn't rip it to shreds. He wasn't mean about it. So just so I don't want to get it wrong. What was that bill for counseling that I received in the mail? <laughs> That's just my normal therapy bill. <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah, but um, but the thing is, is I'm glad that, that you're like, uh, uh, a lot of the great comics I've worked with, great, uh, newer comics, is, is um, you view getting feedback as a, like, like, like if you're taking karate or, or taking golf classes, or it, I would say classes, because you can't say golf course, because golf yeah. course is the place where you play golf. So take, right. you can't take a golf <laughs> course because that's confusing, you know, so, um, but taking classes in golf or, uh, you know, um, taking writing classes, learning how to write a screenplay, or even learning how to play the guitar, you know that people who are better than you are going to criticize you. And then the things that they show you you're doing wrong and the things you can do instead are going to make you better. There's yep. something about stand up comedy because it's such an esoteric art form. And because other than a few really good books, there's really no syllabus where there's really no Rosetta Stone for figuring it out. Mm -hmm. You know, that. A lot of comedians, not everyone, but a lot of comedians view getting advice from somebody as a criticism saying they're not good, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, uh, so that's one of the downsides to having an art form that, that that's kind of like, oh, you learn as you go, that it's passed down by the masters. Yep. So that's something you can just go, you can go to guitar school and you can learn how to play the guitar from a guitar teacher and keep learning, keep learning, go to college, you get a degree in the guitar. Um, but you can't do that in stand up. Yep. You that's know, exactly right. um, yeah, I mean, you can, you, you, you can go to Harvard and take writing classes and write for the National Lampoon or, you know, uh, uh, go to Oberlin and get a degree in screenwriting, whatever. But what I'm talking about stand up. It, you really have to learn it and you learn from the community, the comics that have come before you from watching other comedians, working with comics. And um, if you are the kind of person, I don't mean you personally, but like a, whoever listening is the kind of person that, that doesn't like getting criticism or advice, like, it, it, like it's embarrassing, then it's going to be a hard road to becoming a good comedian. Yep. Yep. 
some of the some of the biggest changes and biggest jumps in my comedy career has come from another comedian saying, "Hey, I just want you to know if you did X, Y, and Z, if you fixed this thing, your stand-up game would jump. If you just rewrote this joke, this would jump." And then the biggest breakthroughs happen after that. Uh, what, I think can I. You- I find that really exciting. Uh, uh, did, did you like, do you have an, like, an example of something somebody told you? Sure. Uh, the most recent one is a uh, shout out to David Studebaker. David Studebaker and I did a show. And, uh, and before that, um, Paul Moon, Gene and I had talked, but both of them had said, Hey, you don't smile on stage. You look like you're not having fun. Even though we're laughing, we're all laughing at the jokes. You don't look like you're having fun. And I was like, that's weird. I did, but I watched a video of me with, with Paul and uh, he's like, yeah, you you look like you're just, you're doing your set and it's funny and everyone's laughing, but you're not smiling. So it's kind of awkward. And I was like, okay. And I, and then David said to me, why, why aren't you smiling? And I said, I hate my smile. Like I hate my teeth. I hate my smile. I don't like it. So I don't smile. I try to keep my mouth closed and not smile. And he goes, you should talk about that. And then I really got emotional because it is something that really affects me that I really hate about myself. And I said, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to talk about that. He's like, you, you have to be open and honest. You have to talk about it. And if you could break that, everything else changes. So I started doing a joke maybe about a month, month and a half ago, two months ago about my teeth right out of the gate. Where I talked about my teeth, I would find somebody in the crowd usually had a nice, beautiful smile and compliment them and then make fun of my teeth. And then everyone would laugh. And now it's out of the way. So I feel comfortable smiling on stage and now everyone doesn't care, right? They're not gonna, I'm not as self-conscious about it. They're not as self-conscious about it. And now my whole set is 10 times better and gets way more last because I'm smiling and they, they're in on the same joke. We're all on the same baseline now. I'm not being self-reserved and very like concerned about my, my smile or my look or whatever. And no one cares. They're all, we're all in on it together now. And it changed everything everything even though i still got last it was still funny people still liked me that one thing was holding me back because i wasn't being i was i was being scared well you know first of all that's a brilliant observation and secondly i have the same thing like you see i'm trying not to smile (laughs) because i figure if i smile you'll smile and have to look at your teeth (laughs) um (laughs) um that's why I love you, Jeff. That's why yeah. I love you. <laughs> but um, but see what you what you what you just said was that was that Paul that said Paul that? yeah Paul Moomjean and David Sudebaker both of them said the same thing. Right. Well, the, uh, I don't know David, but Paul's a genius, and uh, he was also an English teacher and all that yeah. stuff too. So, but uh, that that right there, what you just talked about would be like a whole chapter in a comedy writing book. Yeah, uh, because that is one of the things is like the, uh, uh, the, 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 the overarching principle there is that for modern comedy to work, to fit in the comedy, to be relevant in the modern comedy landscape, um, the stand up one does has to be in service of something. The jokes cannot exist just to get a laugh. Right. They have to be revealing a part of your character, moving your personal narrative along. Um, uh, dealing with the elephant in the room, um, creating empathy, uh, giving people information about who you are as a person, connecting with people, communicating a shared experience uh, with with, uh, with people, and um, and uh, so, and that's another thing I just talked about recently with somebody else is you see a lot of comics go up on stage. And they'll talk about how they look or how they sound or whatever. And it's not that funny, first of all, because they didn't really nail the joke. They think right. that all you have to do is talk about how you look and sound and it's going to be funny. You know, but uh, in your case, you were going, oh, hey, I got weird teeth. I, I, I had a way to get people to laugh. No, you didn't want to talk about it. No. Right. So the fact that you didn't want to talk about it means that when you do it's in uh, talking about doing a joke about your smile is in service to like revealing something that you feel vulnerable about something that that you're uh, uncomfortable about that might inform your other material or who you are how you interact with people yeah. you know even as like 
you know, you know and it even makes the fact that you would want to do a, a podcast that has video component to it, you know, <laughs> that much more courageous, you know. And uh, so, so that's why it works. And like with me, uh, uh, I think Colin O'Brien talks about looking like Tilda Swinton, whatever, because he's funny and he's self-effacing with me. But me, uh, I always get mistaken for woman everywhere I go. <laughs> And I, and, 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 and I hate it. And I'm, when I'm on stage, and if I don't address it, I, yeah. I have a rough minute because people don't know what's going on. They don't know if I'm a woman, if I'm a man, if this is a put on or if, if there's, you know, so they don't, you know. So the reason why my jokes about how I look and sound destroy is because I'm in service to the questions that people have, like, what the hell is going on with this dude? Yeah. And then when I address it with, um, self-awareness with humor with a good attitude and also with some intelligence using jokes that they don't see the coming or I make the association that they wouldn't you know you know like even something simple like 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 uh, opening up like uh you know people like oh ladies and gentlemen Jeff Shaw walk up hey how you doing my name is Jeff welcome to drag queen story hour <laughs> you know something simple like that boom you know I don't have to get heavy about stuff but a joke that addresses and if people weren't going, what's to deal with this person? That joke wouldn't work. Right. You know, so the, the, so so many comics miss the boat. They'll talk about how they look and they sound or something, a physical attribute, because they're looking for an easy in. Right. Whereas the, the best opening jokes, like, I don't like to admit that, that, like, I don't want women in the audience who might be attracted to me to hear that I'm constantly being mistaken for a woman because they they want, you know, a, 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 a you know a macho guy or whatever but then but usually after an hour on stage they can see that i'm a real jerk and they're interested then um, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. um so you know what i mean so so if you were if you were to make fun of something about yourself just because you were trying to get an easy in you were trying to take a shortcut or use a crutch to communicating with the audience that you're likable and worthy of their attention, they smell that, you know, and, right. and it's like, it's not going to work. But so sometimes the, the, the best, you know, the, the overweight comics who don't want to do fat jokes and they hate doing fat jokes are sometimes the funniest, have the yep. funniest joke because they're revealing something and they're trying to communicate who they are to the audience. They're not just trying to, um, hide behind those those jokes right besides they're fat they can't hide behind anything right <laughs> and that's the thing is i i literally when david and i went after uh paul and i talked about it david and i talked about it we were in palm springs we were talking about it and i almost i was emotional like it was an emotional thing where i like i don't want to talk about this i don't want to address it i don't want to talk about it on stage and david's like you have to you have to talk about it you have to address it because you're holding it back and everyone can feel it and everyone can sense it, but no one knows why. And it's very uncomfortable. They're still going to laugh at your jokes because you're, you're a great writer. You're good right. at comedy. You The jokes work, but they're going to work 10 times better if you address this one thing and get it out there in the world. And I remember the first time I did that joke, I, t I wrote a joke. I took it up on stage and it just destroyed. Everyone loved it because I was so honest about it, so vulnerable. That's and I was, I was also scared. I was terrified to do the joke. And now it's, I love, I love it. And it's, it gives me a good way to get someone on the audience on my side. And then also the rest of the audience to laugh at something that I'm making fun of myself for that, that yeah. they know I'm vulnerable about nine times out of 10. And, and, and this could be the soundbite nine times out of 10. When you do a joke about something you really don't want to joke about, or you're afraid to joke about, or you don't think anyone's going to relate to it, you're like, oh, but you feel this compulsion to do it. Nine times out of 10, you know, even if you wait a year to do the joke, it's going to kill the first time you do it. And then nine yeah. times out of 10, when you are speeding to the club, because you're going to show everybody what a genius you are with this joke you have. Uh, and then everyone's going to, you know, everyone's, you know, you're going to, uh, you're going to get a key to the city. And and they're gonna paint over Robin Williams mural and put your your face up. <laughs> Nine times out of ten, the job joke's gonna bomb because yeah. anytime the the reason you write a joke is to make people laugh, to be funny, you're dead in the water. 
Yeah. It, it, you, you, it, comedy is not like that anymore. Right. Comedy is, is supposed to be in service to becoming a better person, to communicating who you are to the world, to um, helping other people deal with their shortcomings and their fears and their, you know, um, uh, their idiosyncr- idiosyncrasies and stuff like that. And, but so, so yeah, that, that's like when people say like becoming better as a comic or taking strides, that is what they're talking about. And that's like reaching a level. And the funny thing is, is you probably could have done that a year ago if they told you a year ago. Yeah. You know, no, I, you know what that, though? I don't think I would have been ready. I don't think I would have really? been ready to, no, I think I would have resisted even more. Because mm-hmm. I literally almost had like a nervous breakdown saying, I don't want to do this joke. I don't want to talk wow. about this. This is not something you know I what? want to talk about. I wish I wish you, I had known you started to address this on stage because I would have given you I would have given you the dozens of jokes I wrote about your smile but had no use for. Them. <laughs> well, you send them my way. I'll, I'll send you 50 bucks. You send them my mm-hmm. way. <laughs> but yeah, that's the thing is, I, I mean, if you ask David Studebaker, I was on the verge of tears saying, I don't, this is not what I want to do. I don't want to talk about this. This is very personal to me. It's a very, it feels like it's something I hate about myself. I've hated about myself forever. It's something that I like, you can ask my wife, like how much I hate my teeth. Can you give me and, one of the lines? I, I, what, what's one of the lines? Um, so I like, talk about, uh, you know, I, everybody else has a gorgeous smile. My wife has a gorgeous smile. I have redneck vampire teeth. I have one soft one here and a sharp one here. So I'm only going to get half your neck, you know, and then, you know, some, uh, what was the other part? There was something about, um, oh, someone, someone mentioned that my smile is infectious, you know, let's not get the CDC involved guys. Come on, let's we're back off, you know? So there's like stuff like that, but I talk about it because I talk about my daughters getting braces and having bad teeth. Like, Hey, look, you're, you're 50% me, 50% your mom, you know, you got all your mom's great looks and my bad teeth, you know, mm-hmm. so. So we talk about a lot of that stuff and how much braces it cost. And I wish I had braces and growing up poor or whatever. So it gets into like being poor material and stuff like that too, which is good. But I really address that. I usually talk, find somebody with a nice smile and say, oh, I love your smile. I love your smile. I wish I had your smile. You know, and then Mind boom. if I give you a, a tag in real time? Sure. Yes, please. Uh, people say that my, my smile is infectious. I, I, you say, um, I believe the word is gingivitis. <laughs> All right. I'm going to use that. I'm going to have a show on Saturday. I'm going to use that. Or you can say, oh, it infectious. Go, oh, that, that's that's the gingivitis. They said, no, infectious, not infected, but it was, well, you can play around with it. But okay. that's, a, that's the beautiful thing about comedy is uh, the closer you nailing a setup or a thing that's real, the more you can tag on it and the more jokes you can add. Yeah. You, it, you know what I mean? You can't hang ornaments on a dead Christmas tree. Yeah. You know, but if, if it's a healthy tree, you can keep putting stuff on there. So that's the same thing with like a joke. That's why it's really important that you talk about something that's real and relatable and that it is, it has emotional um, heft to it because then you, you, any, every joke you can build upon it because you have like the overarching premise of what you're trying to say. And so you yeah. can keep, you know, and also if you're trying to show like you have a good sense of humor about it, then anytime right. somebody says something, you're look like, you know, you're looking for the angle to make a joke about yourself. Yeah. You know, and, and, that, and that's the thing is that, you know, Those are great a, lines. Yeah. yeah, it's a it's a big part of of trying to be honest and real on stage and something that I really, uh, really avoided for a long time. And I just didn't I did not want to do I literally I think I remember even saying to David, like, if I have to do this joke, I probably just will stop doing comedy. Like, I don't want to talk about my teeth. And he's like, really like that? That's that big of a, th- a thing for you. And it yeah. was it was a, such a big thing for me that he like, like, grabbed me by the shoulders and he was like look he's like you're funny you're amazing i wouldn't say anything to you if you were a crappy comedian doing crappy jokes and being hacky and whatever he's like i know how funny and smart smart you are that if you don't address this it's going to affect you so much more it's your your stand-up game is not going to go to the next level because you're going to be stuck in this rut because you're not addressing the biggest thing in the room that you need to be addressing yeah and here's the thing not only yeah that not that that's 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 great advice but and here's the corollary to that um if you don't keep busting to the next level you're going to be looking for other things to talk about yeah and you're always going to be reaching outside yep you know uh bumper stickers and then billboards and then you know uh yeah walmart ads and and everything like that but then uh 
when you when you are able to talk about things that are uncomfortable for you, then then you 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 you'll, you'll continue. Once you make it past that, you'll continue to look inside for humor. Right, and that's that's exactly what I've done. Then I've gone deeper into like who I am and what why I have these issues and what it's about and kind of my childhood or whatever. It's like helped get a lot of other things out that are funnier that I could tie into now having kids and having a wife and those bring those things all together and it makes a, a better storyline too and people are more invested in what I in what I do and say. So it's it was great. It just was a huge breakthrough and it was something that I think a lot of comedians don't know if they don't know that they're not addressing something or they're like I, I don't think I was like consciously consciously not addressing it. I think subconsciously I was just putting it back there and like, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to smile. And I didn't smile on stage. That was a big thing is I didn't, if you go look at a lot of stuff, I don't like to smile on stage. And now I'm like, you know what? Who cares? What are, what what, are they going to do? What, Kick me off because I have a bad smile? <laughs> but you know what's funny though? Uh, uh, in this case, uh, it was true that you weren't smiling because you were, uh, self-conscious and then that this has helped you have a breakthrough right okay but then again you have to realize that comedy isn't one size fits all right i've listened to some podcasts i don't remember the comedians but i think they were like big name comics you know uh that were basically making fun of comics who smile on stage and saying that their biggest their biggest pet peeves when comics are laughing at their own jokes or smiling and that you have to be like like, because then, you know, you're trying to be funny. Whereas if you're not smiling and you're serious, it's like you're a, a, a comedic character and you think your worldview makes sense to you. And then everybody else is just laughing because you're out of your mind. But then you ruin that by smiling. So there's some comic, I've, I've heard some of the best comics in the business say, can't stand what comics laugh or smile at their own material. So it's like, you know, in, in this case, they were right about you specifically. Right. But- and, and, and you know so they could have picked up that there was a reason for you like you were maybe maybe they saw that you were avoiding smiling i was yeah that's 100 percent. right so if you see somebody avoiding smiling that's not the same as somebody not smiling right yeah because they could you know? see like they could see like you're in your own head like being very self-conscious about not smiling on stage being very serious now even like so if you guys watch like anthony jeselnik even when he tells terrible not jokes he smiles after audience. <laughs> yeah. but like ahead. anthony anthony jeselnik will tell a terrible joke a dark joke and then smile so you know it's okay he's knows he's in on the joke there and we get it well, and that's why we laugh with him that, that, that's a that's a different kind of smile that's not a right. real smile he's not right. really smiling like, he's not like yeah but he's got the smile on his face because he knows he's got you he's got you on his right. and on his wavelength right but if he did that joke deadpan and no smile afterwards you'd feel like am i really should i really be laughing at this is this really something i should be like maybe he's serious and now i can't laugh at this because i'm uncomfortable with this is his real worldview but we know that it's not his real worldview that he's a character of his of himself right. really and so we can laugh at it. So there's some people that, that, that you have to have that smile added in. And there's some people who don't, right? Like I yeah, think Robert I Mack think... does smile a little bit or whatever, but a lot of people, Stephen Wright never smiled, right? He wasn't smiling, he was just deadpan, whatever, but you know his style. So you'll still laugh. Right. And also smiling doesn't work with, uh... oh, I just forgot, forgot the comments I was going to mention. Um, uh, uh, I forgot who I was going to mention, but um uh, smiling for certain comics wouldn't work with me it, it does help yeah. because uh it, they they really because sometimes they want to know that i'm really not hurt by my own jokes yeah you yeah. know and so like for example if you were to do jokes like you couldn't do your jokes about your smile without smiling right exactly right yeah you have to smile afterwards yeah, right. and you can even go like smile. You can even do that joke. It gets a huge laugh, and then you smile and you go, uh, uh. and then that would probably, you're like, oh, uh. and then get rid of your smile right away. And that would probably make them laugh. Yeah, that's you know, a good that's idea. That's another little thing you can do. That's like a, like a, a a visual tag that you can do, you know. Um, but again, once you have the premise defined or the purpose of the joke defined, you can keep adding on jokes and going any direction. Yeah. You know, because a, a, a premise or a joke with a purpose or a target of a joke, a joke that has something that it's making fun of, whatever, 
it's like a virus that just keeps spreading. Right. You know? Yeah. That's exactly right. So Jeff, where are you going to be? Where can people find you? Are you going to be, how many more cruise ships you got for the rest of the year? What's going on for the rest of the year? What's your next year look like? Oh, it's all cruises for the end of the year. Um, nice. And mostly next year too. Uh, but I have some, uh, uh, I had a lot of great clubs this year. I got some good clubs next year, like the Grove and um, the Grove in uh, Lowell, Arkansas in uh, February. And then Fremen's uh, restaurant in Louisiana. It's a high scale uh, dining and entertainment venue. That's in May. Uh, mostly, uh, you know, cruise ships and corporate stuff. And my schedule is on uh, comedianjeffshaw.com. Perfect. And uh, clips from both of my dry bar special are on YouTube and also the video page on my website. Awesome. And then the app has my specials on there. And if you're a fan of clean comedy, you got to have the dry bar app. It's pretty cheap every month. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I'll put all the links in the show notes below so you guys can have all that stuff. And Jeff, I appreciate everything you've done for me. I appreciate every, like, all you always give me good advice. You always give jokes. If you guys are listening to this, go back and listen to it again because Jeff gives the best advice. And you're going to find a nugget in here. He's so honest and real about it. He's really good at, at finding that little thing to make your jokes better. Uh, he's probably not going to do that for everybody, but uh, he, you'll be able to go back and kind of get a little, use a little bit of his wisdom to make your stuff better. So I really do appreciate it. It's, it's great having friends like you. I, 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 I really yeah. value it. Uh, can I, can I add to that? We're yes, talking please. about, uh, uh, Moon Jim. Uh, I, yeah. I always get his last name. It's Paul Moon Jim, right? Moon, M-O-O-M-J. Moon, Moon Jim. Okay. Yeah. Not Moon Beam, Moon Jim. No. <laughs> yeah. He's... And, uh, I would subscribe to the flapper. If you're a young comic looking for great advice, subscribe to the uh, flappers university newsletter. Yes. In LA, you know, they have, uh, I get it every week. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, he has, and I've talked to him about this. Um, uh, he, he has a, uh, you know, in, he does a, like a, in that newsletter, he has a, an essay yep. on comedy, you know, it, every, it's, every uh, week, every, every week. And I think he is trying to write a book, but I told him that if he just compiles all those essays, and put some of the book, it could be one of the best books on comedy ever written. Yeah, so it, it, uh, totally. Yeah, and um, so anybody who, who likes, you know, getting a, a, a advice, check that, that column out. So yeah. yeah, I keep wanting to do that. I keep wanting to add like a clean comedy podcast newsletter where I do something like that. I probably should do that with all this advice and stuff we get from people. So it might be something uh, we do in the future. Yeah, um, I, I thought of like, doing a comedy podcast or writing a book on comedy. But then like the last thing I need is to help comics get better than me and take my work. <laughs> well, I have no work for them to steal, so I don't care. Like it's all good for me. <laughs> well, thank you all again, right. Jeff. Thank you everybody for listening. Please like subscribe. I'll put all the links in there. Go check out Jeff's stuff. It's amazing. Go check out dry bar comedy, support them. We need more and more of that to come out so we can have more laughter and we have more opportunities I really appreciate it and have a good one. We'll talk to you soon, guys. Bye.